So yeah, so um, uh, this week was uh, uh, function operators um, uh, wrapping up uh, I believe the second part of functional, uh, part two functional programming. Um, it's like a relatively short chapter compared to the others. Um, uh, but there's, I guess, a few things I'd like to like discuss, especially the case study. You know, if we could like walk through that, if others want to do that, I think that'd be nice, but uh, yeah, I'll get going. Um, all right. Um, so just to kind of have a little bit of review and also like connections to the previous chapters. Um, so we saw chapters on functionals, function factories, and now function operators. Um, and uh, a functional, they're all like kind of slightly similar. Um, obviously they all deal with uh, either taking functions as arguments, outputting functions or both. Um, and so a functional is like, uh, you know, the per family of functions like map um, or uh, uh, L apply, I believe as well, um, and all the applies, uh, which takes a function as an input and, or say, sorry, take, is that right? No, takes the function, yes, okay. Takes a function as an input and returns as a vector as an output, right? So you have like a list of arguments, a vector of arguments, and you apply them to using a function like over and over again. Um, and then we have function factories that uh, is a function that makes functions. Um, so, uh, you know, you can supply like a, uh, some kind of condition or something uh, that will set up a function in a certain way. Um, and that always returns functions. And then a function operator, uh, Hadley like kind of describes it as uh, basically in the family of function factories, except that uh, the difference between what we talked about last week or a couple of weeks ago is that a uh, function operator actually takes a function as, a, as an argument, as an input, and then returns a function as an output. Um, and then the two packages that they're kind of heavily used in this chapter are her, and um, someone's gonna have to help me with this one. Uh, it's so hard when you never hear these things said out loud. Is it memoys? Uh, is that? How you all would say it? I hear it. I said it in my mind. Oh. Yeah. What is sorry, Chris? Uh, what you... I, I say memoize in my mind. Also haven't heard it though. Memo, memoize. Yeah, that makes sense. Cause like it's like caching, so you're like recording it kind of like memoizing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's interesting. Well, you see, like actually knowing how to pronounce it, I think uh, that sounds right. Cause like I think that explanation makes sense. So we'll go with it for now. <laughs> Thanks. Um, all right. Uh, so this is just, you know, kind of the first example that Hadley had in the book of function operators. So in this case, um, it's Tay, this function is taking this function F as input it's forcing its evaluation. Um, and then it's uh, just getting, uh, I believe the, the first argument, um, the X argument here and outputting uh, like, so it's kind of modifying that function to output this processing three, um, processing two, whatever the X argument is, um, you know, in addition to actually uh, computing uh, this uh, X squared. Uh, call. Um, so taking a function as an argument, uh, doing something with it or to it, and then returning a function as an output. Um, anyone have anything else on this one? Okay, um, so some common uses uh, Hadley talks about. So um, in uh, for loops, like one advantage of, of doing a for loop, uh, just kind of traditional for loop is that uh, you get kind of all the output up until the, the moment that the loop like breaks for some reason, um, in this case, like an invalid type. Um, but if you do just a, you know, a straight uh, map, um, functional, uh, and there's an error, you'll get the error message, but you won't know, you won't get the output up until that moment, and you won't know kind of which one broke, at least from, from that error message. Um, 
Uh, so the common, the way that Halley talks about solving this um, is by using the safely function, um, which will return each, every time, um, for each time a function is called that safely is wrapping, uh, it'll return the result and, um, and uh, it will return two items, a result and an error uh, list. Um, so if there was an error and, or if there was a result, like it'll be contained in those items in the list um, and you'll have the message and then some more detailed like call stack uh, information. Um, and yeah, and so that's really nice because if you're uh, doing something with uh, like a map function, for instance, you'll be able to see kind of all the output. And actually in this case, uh, for those of you who have done the presentations uh, with, uh, uh, I forget how to say this, Xerian, Xerian, um, Xerian, uh, like I, it's kind of funny because like a lot of these examples in the book are intentionally intentionally produce errors uh, and um, and Xerian like if you go to like compile it unless you say like you don't want to evaluate this this cell it like won't compile because there's an error in it um, in the, one of the cells and so in this case uh, it actually uh, does run and does output something and it doesn't interrupt the kind of uh, knitting of the HTML file because you have this safely uh, wrapped around it. Um, and so that's in, that's kind of neat, uh, but also um, Hadley mentions that this output isn't like ideal uh, because if you wanted to see kind of a list of all the errors and all the results, they're, in, they're kind of nested in different lists and that would make it a little bit difficult to uh, see those all together. Um, so he talks about this transpose function. I thought this was like the most interesting part of the chapter, at least for me. I've never used this and I still don't quite know uh, which cases I would use it for. I, can't, or I kind of understand how it's used, but I uh, can't think of anything in my work or whatever that I would use it for. But, um, but in this case, it basically is like um, turning the list like inside out. So now what was at the, the most inner level of the list, um, when you call transpose, those items are now the most outer level. Um, and then, um, and then you know, the, the numeric result is now in, in the results, this result list of four, and then the uh, errors are now listed all together. Um, I was just curious, has anyone used like transpose before? Um, for this, like, for this chapter, or heard of it, or uh, thought about using it. That was kind of interesting, kind of a neat, useful thing, potentially. I haven't used it. I have a lot of um, JSON columns in our SQL database that I'm constantly struggling with. And I was, when I read this chapter, I thought about what the use case would be for those. But mm -hmm. Yeah, I think about JSONs a lot, I think, with some of this, um, the content in this book, like uh, the other place I think is like with Pluck. Like if you have, uh, yeah, like named nested, like values, like kind of just going as deep as you need to, to pull them out. Uh, that this like transpose and Pluck seem like they, they, they both are useful in that context. Um, But it did seem like kind of a um, uh, detour, I guess. And like, it seemed like it was a good place to like pull out this function to show what it, how it's useful, but uh, it didn't seem totally like, it didn't seem unique to like function operators or useful only to function operators, but no. Anyway, okay, oops. Um, Okay. Um, all right. So memoize. Uh, yeah, that's definitely. That's, I think that's definitely right. Um, so uh, memoize is another function operator that's kind of a common. It's common along with per safely a common function operator that's used in R. Um, and so uh, in this case, you have two functions that, um, or one function that 
is described as a or named as a slow function uh, because it's going to uh, sleep for I believe it's was it a second? Uh, is that right? Um, a second before uh, evaluating uh, x times ten times um, uh, was this a random number uh, between zero and one? Is that right? A random numeric? I always forget. think it's a random number of just one length of one length okay 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 got it thank you um i know there's a whole family of those and i always forget what you, each of them does um all right and so uh if you um look at uh kind of the system time system time before and after um you run it, you see that uh, it takes like a second uh, to, um, to uh, in terms of time elapsed from the beginning to the end of the function. Um, and then uh, if you um, memoize it, basically it's caching the uh, results uh, from the first run of the function um, so that the first time it's run, uh, you actually, you don't see a difference in time. Um, so this, so you see this time here elapsed, like one second is, is almost identical to what you saw before. Um, but then the second time it's run, since it's being cached in memory, um, the, that function environment is like cached in memory. Um, you see it takes like, it's almost instantaneous. It takes less than, uh, you know, uh, a tenth of a second, um, which is uh, pretty interesting. Like if you, you know, have a case where you're running a function that does some kind of operation um, that could be used in the next call of that function. Um, uh, you know, this could save a lot of time potentially, as you can see, it's, uh, you know, over, uh, or sorry, this is less than uh, uh, two one hundredths of a second, my bad, uh, I heard that wrong. Um, all right, so same question. Has anyone used like caching in R before, like memo-wise? Um, be interested in hearing some like about some more like, use cases or anything, or anything people thought of when reading this part. I personally, I uh, there uh, I use like uh, Spark sometimes, um, which is kind of a distributed computing language, and uh, I feel like this kind of thing comes up a lot um, because it doesn't like it, it won't like it'll be it's very lazy in terms of its evaluation. It won't evaluate anything like up until you need it, but then if you um, if you cache it things become a lot faster after the, sec the second time and the third time and the fourth time that you run a certain function um, because it's saving it on disk or in memory and um, and uh, it can really like speed things up dramatically. So that's, I don't know, that's the other, I've never done it in R, but uh, that's what I think about with this. Um, okay. Uh, all right, and that's the last uh, slide I have here, um, but I wanted to go into this uh, case study, Let's see if I can get it up to this other screen. Okay, um, so this is the third part of the chapter, um, this, uh, Case study. Uh, is it, oh, before I go to that, is there are there any of these exercises that folks like wanted to talk about? Uh, I guess this is the only one here. Um, I didn't really understand when I when I would use possibly instead of safely, but I was trying to um, to hit a, an API to return some JSON and possibly ended up working, but I, I wasn't sure why. So if anyone could clarify. Like, oh, you tried both possibly and safely. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I actually skipped over it possibly. So uh, if I'm being honest, uh, so I need to look at the documentation here. 
Let's see, possibly wrapped function uses the default value whenever an error occurs. Safely wrapped function instead returns a list of the components result in error. So is it just is it just that it uses a default value if there's an error? Is that the difference? I, I, I guess. Um, but oh, it does. Anyway, uh, error. I guess those errors error. safely didn't work. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not. I've never used these in sure, practice. And then I wasn't sure where I was supposed to place it, um, so that was also tricky. Um, but. It was like in the map call, I put safely around the function I want it to iterate over. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was trying to right. like put it inside the function to like safely ping. I don't know. <laughs> but. Yeah, does anyone else have any ideas about that? Kevin, I just wanted to uh, kind of apologize. I've been I, I am listening to what you're saying, but I'm not participating much because I have my hands full preparing for the statistics uh, session that's coming up next. Oh, no worries. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm just glad you're able to make it, but uh, thanks. Yeah. Have you, has anyone, uh, Mike or anyone else like ever used possibly or safely? Uh, I use safely quite a bit because I'm spitting out. We have like a hundred some odd organizations that we want to do um, certain graphs for, mm -hmm. and so I use I just wrap the uh, code in safely to spit them out, even if they don't have enough data. It'll just air out, and I don't have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. A little bit lazy of me, but <laughs> it works. Do Do you run? <clears throat> Do you run safely uh, to graph all of them and then just extract the ones that weren't uh, an error, kind of like the example in the book? Well, actually, so the function ha actually creates the graph and then saves the graph um, in a uh, folder. So then I'll just go grab the, I use walk and just to put everything in the folder and then I'll grab the contents in the folder. I need to figure out how to put it up in box automatically. I know there's a way that it just, Insert, insert stuff in a box, but I just manually put it up in a box so that the marketing team can grab them and put them in there. And we call them one pagers. But it makes my life super easy. I feel bad for our designer because he's having to. Now, what would be really nice is be able to pop out a um, our markdown that was like branded to to specification, but I couldn't couldn't get it. But the, yeah, so anyway, that's, I don't even do anything with the error messages. I just uh, wrap the function in safely and then I plop it in walk. I see. So if there's if there's an error, there's no file and then yeah, exactly. nothing to worry about. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I'm just trying to see if I can glean anything quickly from uh, Jake's question. So I guess it sounds like the difference is like replacing the errors with values and like returning a default value versus returning both the results and errors. Uh, but this otherwise equals null seems like a similar argument. So, so maybe that we'll makes sense because more. I was using map DFR. So it was trying to append rows to a data frame. Um, so I guess with safely it would have it would have like tried to return lists and maybe maybe you just can't use safely with with map DFR since it's expecting rows of a data frame. Um, so maybe that's mm -hmm. why possibly was the answer. Now that I think about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I I guess we could also bring yeah bringing this back out to the advanced R channel and see. There's others like other cohorts that have talked through this distinction a little more. Um, all right. Um, cool. All right. Is there anything else you all want to discuss about uh, 
this a couple things that I didn't, um, I was going to go over the talk through the case study, but uh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Oh, uh, I was seeing some code that I did. I was actually doing some web scraping and now turning the results into a data frame. And was exactly like Jake said, I use it possibly because I like each row, each row was a row in a data frame. So I have to use possibly. So I created a, a code that an error like I know every error we have the same value. So I could took, mm. could took out the er error later and then I don't have like a lot of lists with nodes there. I don't have to use. So your your default value and possibly in that case was a data frame row? Yeah. yeah. Is that right? Actually, with like, with like yeah, some kind uh, of special indication that the values yeah, were I missing. actually gave a, a string. I just a string and like every row, every column would be the same string. So it's easy to take, take it out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, that, that, uh, that makes sense. Um, thanks for, thanks for sharing. Um, all right. So I guess we could talk through this, uh, section here. Um, so Hadley kind of creates a, creates a case study here um, that is actually similar, I think, to what um, uh, we were just chatting about a second ago uh, with web scraping, um, uh, because you know he's setting up this scenario. We have a, a bunch of um, URLs and like paths to download files from, um, but that you wouldn't want to necessarily hit those URLs over and over again, kind of um, without any sort of break, because there might be some kind of um, uh, throttling, like on the server side, that would, um, you know, make it uh, interrupt your 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 loop. Um, so he has this like uh, mega uh, nested, like a bunch of things happening here as like an example of, of one way you could do this where for all each of the URLs kind of in this, um, in this uh, vector, um, you know, sleep for some wait for some kind of some time um, uh, output this like uh, uh, dot like uh, indicator of like how much progress you're making through the list. Um, just like kind of like a progress bar and then actually download the file. Um, and so he kind of talks about like breaking those up, each of those pieces up so that it's a little bit clear, like what, um, you know, what the purpose is of like each, like, you know, the delay piece, the progress piece and the download piece. Um, uh, so he kind of starts off and showing that each of these can be done with a, um, basically a, 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 a function operator because um, at the, uh, just kind of stepping ahead of here for a second, by the end, he's uh, showing an example where you basically have uh, those, these, this dot uh, function operator and this delay by function operator, both kind of uh, being nested and like taking a, a function as like an argument um, from the output of the, the inner, inner function. Um, and so the first one he mentions here is this uh, delay by uh, function operator, which um, takes a function and an amount, forces the evaluation of it, of both the argument and the function, um, uh, and then uh, sleeps for some time um, uh, after, after that. So, but it's returning this, this like, basically, you know, it's very similar to a function factory. Um, but it's like sleeping before pausing for some time before it actually evaluates. Um, and you get a function back from that, um, just, that just has like a delay uh, attached to it. Um, and so it shows that you can basically do, um, you know, do something similar to, uh, I guess what you saw at the beginning here where you have some URLs a path and a download uh, file function. Um, except to now you wrap it with this delay function operator um, so that you're kind of modifying this download file function to have a delay before it actually 
runs each time when you're walking through the, the URLs. I'm going to stop here. Is there anything like that? Uh, I don't know if I explained that super clearly or talked through that super clearly, but is there anything that you all would like to talk about more here before I go on to the next part? Uh, really clear. That was a great walkthrough. Cool. Thanks. Okay, sounds good. Um, okay, and then uh, and then the second part of this is the kind of dot every uh, function operator. So again, it's a similar in the sense that it's uh, forcing the evaluation of both the, the function that's being passed and um, this n argument. Um, and so I believe in this case, N is like uh, how how often, yeah. So it's like a it'll, it'll impact how often you're outputting this progress bar um, based on if it's a if it divides uh, evenly into uh, whatever the index is at that moment in time. Um, and um, and yeah. Uh, so let's see. Sorry, I shouldn't. I see this part before I'm trying to understand what's showing there. Oh, I see. Okay. So you're just showing that you can run it uh, with, with and without this, this dot every progress bar function. And that uh, when you wrap it in this dot every progress bar function. Um, it's kind of doing the same thing, except it's uh, as a side effect. It's like outputting this progress bar um, every, I guess, 10, 10 iterations. Um, OK, and then you can kind of rewrite it all together. Uh, and he thinks kind of in a cleaner, easier to understand way uh, where you're, uh, you know, how you have this download file function. Um, I forget what this. Oh, that's how much the delay is before you run run it again. Um, uh, and then and then you're uh, and then when this finishes running, it's going to pass the. I guess I think the function that's being outputted there, the dot every and then dot every gives a progress if it meets this condition. Um, uh, and you kind of get the results that he was talking about in the beginning, where you have uh, a delay and a progress bar in addition to actually downloading the files um, without with a kind of different modules, like different parts of, of this process being broken up. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know what you all think about this, but when I looked at this, it didn't, I, I, I guess it's a little bit clearer than this. Um, but at least here, it's kind of like a, I don't know. I feel like this is a little bit more readable for me. Um, I think if you just go to the next chunk after that, um, he says that it's not so readable. Um, and oh, he pipes he it. Pipe. I see. I was going to say, I, I actually, yeah, thank you. I forgot about this part, uh, or maybe I, I <laughs> missed that part because I was looking at this and I was like, isn't the whole point of like, you know, the tidyverse and piping so that you don't have all this nested logic happening, you know, you can just like look at it in sequence and, um, and you don't have to like reason from the inside out really. Um, cool. Okay. Well then, then yes, this looks, so then this is a little bit clear because you're basically, you know, you're naming the thing that's happening in each step without seeing all the kind of messy, details and like conditions that are happening. Um, I don't know that dot every is easy to read. If I was handed someone else's code that had that dot okay. every logic, um, I don't know that I would just intuitively figure it out right away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this also, uh, I know, I think a few chapters ago, I think Jake, when you presented, uh, there was that we had that discussion about um, like style style and like how that he advises against like multi-line anonymous functions you know like like uh i think there was some wasn't didn't we talk about that um 
And like, this seems like kind of similar in like a stylistic way to like a multi-line anonymous function. Like, like you're, you're, um, I don't know. Like it's not, it, it is multi-line except you just put it all on one line, but like you could, well, you know, pipe it down and have a, you know, I don't know. It just. I think yeah. the anonymous function is when you say function X and then write out mm -hmm. the content of the function in there. I don't know that it's like just piping right. in a line. I don't know yeah, I'm yeah. Saying not to do that. Yeah, I guess it's not exactly an anonymous function, but like I, I guess what I was saying is that that um that it, it like I guess the readability seems similar uh, of those two situ of those in those two situations. I don't know. I have, I have no shame. I, I was reading some, uh, some no. regex the other day, and I was you know it was just easier to read to just pipe a couple yeah. of regex steps. I do this. I do the same thing. I. Yeah, I've done some really bad things where like uh, I'm like mapping inside a map and like <laughs> yeah, and that, that that's definitely not good uh, <laughs> uh, in any case. But um, what do they call that O notation? What's your O notation for mapping inside a map? That can't be efficient, right? <laughs> Probably uh, I don't know O n squared. I don't I don't know. Uh, yeah, it sounds exponential for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do people actually, I don't know. I feel like I, I want to find a book that explains like how to under, how to like calculate that O notation stuff for each like algorithm. I never, I, I feel like I, I don't really know how people arrive no, at the. I don't either. I just um, found this uh, Harvard CS50 course. That's mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Super good presentation. He talks about stuff. Yeah. I mean, like, are people able to just look at uh, like a function and say whether it's like, I, I feel like I've seen people do that before, but like, I don't know, often know, most of the time know the correct answer. So I don't know, like, if they're just like pulling it out of nowhere or like if they, you know, like they actually are like calculate, calculating somehow from like the, from the algorithm or the script that's, that's in front of them. Um, I guess, I guess people do, but I, I just, I need to take out a course, I guess. Um, at the end of this book. We'll be able to do it. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> all right, that'd be nice. Um, all right, so I guess we were just talking through this question here. Oh, I guess, oh no, he's he's flipping. So he's flipping it here. So he's saying, do dot every. What's the pros and cons of doing dot every before delay and doing dot every after delay the delay. Um, I guess if you, I don't know, if you want to know, if you want dot every to be an indication of how far along this download file process is, I wouldn't want it to wait any amount of time. I wanted to know, I would want to know right after this download file is, uh, you know, each time it's executed and successfully run. But I don't know. What do you guys think? Well, it wouldn't want to just give you a blast of dots if you don't have the delay in there first. Hmm. It? I could almost defeat the purpose of having like dots meant to like I'm delaying, but I've got this indicator that I'm making progress. Whereas if you do it before the delay, it's just gonna blast you with dots. But isn't isn't the dot thing like the uh, overall progress, or is it? Or sorry, isn't it like for the whole like uh, vector of of operations that you're doing, or am I wrong about that? Uh. Oh, actually, yeah, you're right. He does the delay after the dot. So doing it after, I don't know. I got no clue. It's like in this in this first example, uh, the dot. It's just in relation to how many URLs there are, you know. And I think that's replicated with this this uh, function operator version. Um, so anyway, I think, I think it would s still, um, Does order matter, I guess? Maybe the second version would just 
spit out dots at you? I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. I guess the we main could, example we could have run it. Delay after. Mm. Yeah, could throw this into our studio and see. See what happens. Um, there. So then here, right? Or I need, do I need, oh, shoot. Uh, oh, it's just, okay. Ah, there we go. Yeah, so then it would be a question about this here, right? Let's see, so this would be dot every first. Uh, so is that not, oh, I guess it's, uh, so it's, is it saving somewhere? Sorry, I need to look back at this. Is this, is this, I guess it's, is it not actually outputting anything? URLs. Well, there's only two URLs. Right. But is it downloading? Oh, is it downloading these files somewhere? Oh, a download file. I, I guess I don't know what the, how that function works. Okay. And then the path. Maybe you have to put like the dot every 10, two, I mean, instead of 10, and you only have two URLs. Oh, yeah. We could also we just, just do it every. To map over. Right. Um, let's still right. give us some dots. Oh yeah, did those two little dots? Uh, there's two right there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, how about we just do this? Uh, URLs. Uh, Can you unnest and many, many more to give us the rest of them? Did this work? Sorry. Uh, joke. What'd you say? Sorry. I said unnest the end many, many more. All right, there we go. I did it many times. Ah, uh, you're okay. There we go. It's kind of hard to see, but it's output. Okay, it's now it's in your console. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, the contrast is kind of bad in the uh, below the, the chunk. All right, uh, let me just so let's see. So, okay, so that was ever. This is before um, before the delay. This is after. All right. Same thing. I don't know. I think it's kind of it's just the same doing the same thing, right? I, I think, yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's just a preference about uh, like if you have a super like a really long uh, process that you're looping over and like each time it takes like, you know, 15 or 20 minutes and then you have a delay afterwards, like, and you want to see that it's like actually working, but your delay is like five minutes. You wouldn't want to wait five minutes to see that one has finished if you to wait for that one dot just because there's a delay after you know like you would want to have that feedback right away after the download is finished right in that case i don't know maybe that's the distinction he's trying to make i, I can't think of anything else that's All right, uh, let me talk through a couple more of these here. Uh, 
Um, uh, so should you memoize, file, download? Why or why not? I mean, I would say no, because it's a different file that's being downloaded each time, right? So like you wouldn't get any benefit from saving the last file that was downloaded because it's going to be a different URL unless like what we just did, right? Where like I repeated two URLs 20 times, then it would be faster if you memorized uh, file download, right? Could do that quickly. Sorry. Oh. Oh, maybe I have to do it like this. Oh. Uh, this is what I get when I try to do these things. Uh, is this from a, a package or something? I feel like I just saw it. Oh, it's download file. Oh, there we go. All right, let's see if it's like, this is faster. Oh, I have to do the actual function. Oh, look at that. Oh, <laughs> nice. That's kind of cool. That's really cool. See, it was like the first two were like super slow and then it like just like instantaneously kind of finished. Thursday night inter entertainment. <laughs> Memoizing. Yeah. File download. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm satisfied with that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was cool. Is there anything? Is there anything else from this chapter that uh, you guys want to talk about? Uh, I don't know, looking through these last two questions, three questions maybe. Um, create a function operator reports whenever a file is created. Or... Did you, do you all try any of these here? Oh. Yeah, I felt like this last case study for me was a little bit more of a, I don't know, I guess it's a realistic scenario in terms of uh, having a delay when you're, when you're doing something with like a API or a URL or something. Uh, but uh, I don't know. It seems like one of his like kind of kind of complicated explanations or examples to explain the concepts, but not necessarily something you could see yourself doing. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it felt a bit uh, acrobatic, and mm -hmm. I'm I'm not totally sold, but uh, <laughs> definitely interesting. Yeah. I think like other chapters in the book, uh, you could see how it's useful, but unless you have a use for it right now, it's kind of, you know, like an academic question. It's like, you know, but you know, when, when, I, when I get to that point where I, I, I could really use this, I'm going to come back and reread this. Mm -hmm. I had the yeah. same thought, Mike. It's funny you say that. Yeah, there's a lot, I think, in this book that seems helpful as like a reference. You know, it's like useful that we know it's it exists, that it's here, 
like kind of like a survey almost. Um, yeah, I, I think the other thing about this functional stuff and function operators and all these function related things uh, is that, like he said at the beginning of this chapter, like there's nothing that you can't do. There's none of this. You can do all the stuff that he's showing in these three chapters without these uh, different types of techniques, but that it's like kind of more elegant or, or whatever. In some cases, if you do it with like a function operator, um, I don't know, I guess I keep coming back to that. And like, I'm not sure if I can differentiate right now when you would want to use these techniques. Like, I don't know, like, couldn't you write this by just like, by not uh, like passing anything to dot every and delay by like like they just whenever this is finished this just gives you a dot if it's a certain interval i don't know like i it seems like this could be a lot easier if, if you didn't use uh function operators but uh, maybe that's not the point uh, i think this is the second time he's used the global assignment in a function that's nested inside of a function. So maybe I feel like he's trying to like uh, find use cases for that. Like how do you get an, an object? Oh, here, here you yeah. mean this, uh, this indexer? Yeah. Yeah. Cause I swear I've seen this pattern before in an earlier. Mm -hmm. So when this is done running, this I should be in your like environment. Uh, well, no, it stays in, does it go in your environment? I thought it would just I think it, in an environment. I think that too, the, that assignment operator, I think I think that's what this is here, this 4L. Uh, but it would just be four, because it was like 20. Yeah, um, my, I was thinking it would stay in the, so you got the parent function, then you got the sub function, and the global assignment's happening in the sub function, so it would assign it to the parent function environment. Or the calculation environment, not like the, mm -hmm. not in your environment. Like the, right. I don't. So I guess the <laughs> question is if is it is that going like one level up to the? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Function environment that is that's being called, or is it going all the way up to your global environment? Yeah. Yeah, I thought it just goes up one to the um to the parent function, like you were saying. Okay. Yeah. I thought. But I, I need to um, I need to brush off the uh, chapter on uh, on environments and and the chapter on functions because it gets a little uh, tangled up in my head. Yeah, me too. Did you create I in your environment somewhere else? Maybe. Maybe. Uh, let's see. Fit. Yeah, maybe in like a for loop. Yeah, this is still open for my presentation before. Uh, I don't know, it could be, yeah. Uh, it's, yeah, because it's only four, right? So like, I think in this case, it would be 20 once it, when this is finished because uh, there's 20 URLs uh, when I, after I've done this repeat. Yeah, so that seems right, right? Because each of these paths and URLs is 20 in length 20. Unless it's being like memoized or something, I don't know. I, I, <laughs> I did that memoriz memorization. Uh, it's too late for that, I don't know. <laughs> um, all right, uh, that's all I have really. Uh, does anyone else want to talk about anything from this chapter? Maybe like five minutes until. 8.30 here. All right. Um, well, I, I just want to say thanks. Thanks for putting in the effort. I wish I'd been tuned in a little bit more. Uh, I just got an email. So anyway, um, I, I, maybe right. I'll see some of you in the stats uh, book club in a couple of minutes.